Looks like we've started our recording and our webinar is now streaming live on YouTube. So welcome everyone on YouTube. We will wait. We will wait just another minute or so to see how many more people join before we get started. All right, excellent. Thank you everybody for attending today for our consumer talks about heat pumps. Today we're talking specifically about um, how you can go electric to an electric heat pump. So um, Dave will tell you what that means and all about it and give you lots of good information. I just wanna say welcome. Um, thank you to our sponsors, Garfield Clean Energy, Holy Cross Energy, Energy Smart Colorado, the Colorado Energy Office um, and CORE, Colorado's or <laughs> Center for, for um, Community Office of Resource Efficiency. Thanks, Mary, because I just drew a total blank as I'm talking, and I always remember that. So sorry, all my core friends out there. And um, thank you all for coming in. A few housekeeping items. We would love for you to type your questions throughout the webinar in the Q&A, and then right at the end, collectively, myself and Mary and Matt, who are kind of hosting the webinar today, will um, ask those questions to Dave and we'll get as many of those in at the end as we can. Um, so I didn't introduce myself, but I'm Nikki at Walking Mountain Science Center. Matt from Walking Mountains here is also helping us. And I'm going to introduce Mary from Holy Cross Energy. And she's going to tell you all about our speaker, Dave, today. Thanks, Nikki. Hey, welcome, everybody. We're so glad. It's a great way to spend a cold evening in front of your computer with a hot cup of tea, which I just made. So welcome, everybody. I am the Energy Efficiency and Electrification Administrator for Holy Cross Energy, and we want to welcome everybody. And so um, I want to introduce our speaker today, or I should say presenter, it's so weird on Zoom, right? You're a presenter, Dave, right? So Dave Petroy has over 15 years of experience in renewable energy and sustainability roles. He founded and was the president of the Blue Valley Energy, which is a ground source, or we all know it as geothermal heat pump engineering design firm in Boulder. So he's located in Gun Barrel right now in the Boulder area. And then in 2017, he started the NTS Energy Consulting Firm that helps people learn about efficient heating and cooling systems like a cold climate heat pump, what we're gonna talk about just now. So Dave, why don't you start us off and uh, welcome everybody. Thanks, Mary and Nikki and Matt. Um, just to avoid some confusion, I noticed I didn't change the first slide. So just look at the host slide on the right. The left side says contractor toxin. And this is not for contractors today, though they're welcome. This is gonna be for uh, homeowners, specifically people with electric homes. And let's see if I can get my mouse to work here. So we've got quite a few topics today. I've got about 35 slides. I, my goal is to always try to get through them in under 35 minutes. Sometimes it might take a little bit. We'll be here for the hour or more. I'm gonna talk, all, uh, talk about heat pumps, how they work, what cold climate heat pumps are, uh, some scenarios about replacing electric furnaces, baseboard, indoor air quality. How do you know you're going to get a good system? How do you talk to contractors? Something about homes with electric boilers. And so quite a bit to cover. And there's an appendix uh, for anything we don't get through today that will have a lot more information. So let's get started. So heat pumps... Um, Heat pumps, let's talk about what they are and how they work. And so this is an example. Heat pumps have an indoor section and an outdoor section. So on the left side here, we have pretty much an outdoor unit, which looks a lot like an air conditioner. And there's two line sets that go into an indoor unit, which will be called an air handler. And that connects into a duct system. So typically those are called ducted or whole house um, heat pump systems. The other scenario we're going to talk about, an outdoor unit also looks a little bit different um, than, than the uh, other the ducted style. And there's a lot, two line, refrigerant lines going to each of the indoor unit. This is called mini splits 
or ductless, where you can basically have three different indoor units off of one outdoor unit. Um, these indoor units sort of behave the same as in terms of how they operate. So let's go and talk about how these things work. So what is a heat pump? It's really just a reversible air conditioner. And the one thing you have to think about is heat pumps don't care about temperature. They extract, concentrate, and move heat, not temperature. So let's look at this. And we had talked about we had our outdoor unit, and that's this section here in this little diagram. It's got it's called an evaporator compressor expansion valve. And then there's the indoor unit, which is generally called the air handler with a coil, or you could even put a coil on top of a, a furnace, but that's for the talks in the next couple of weeks. So let's just, I'm just gonna go through this real quickly about how it works is sort of the basic level. So you have refrigerant. Refrigerant loves to absorb heat and give up heat. In fact, if you put a refrigerant on a, on a stove, it would boil it almost right away. Um, so let, let's start right here. Refrigerant comes from, in, through the pipes into the indoor unit. And there's a coil and air blows by if it's a ducted system or any kind of system. Air blows by this hot refrigerant, which is typically between 95 and 105 degrees. And it, and it warm, warms your house. And then it gives up its heat. So the refrigerant is giving up its heat. It's cooling off. It's coming out much lower temperature. Now, the thing about it is heat always moves from hot to cool. So you really have to get this refrigerant cooled down. So it goes through an expansion valve, which means basically a little bit of refrigerant has more room and it expands and it cools down dramatically. When it cools down dramatically, now it goes outside and the amount of expansion is controlled by the, the intelligence of the system. It'll be lower than the outdoor temperature. So if the outdoor temperature is 10 degrees, this stuff might be minus 20 degrees. So what happens, it gets into this outdoor unit, there's a fan blowing the air by, and the refrigerant now starts to absorb heat, starts to transform into a warmer vapor. It picks up as much heat as it can, depending on the outdoor temperature. The fan speed might be blowing a little a variable faster to pick up more temperature. It's gathering as much heat as it can from the outside air, and it's coming back in. It's warmed up as a vapor, but it has to be warm enough 195 to 105 to, to heat your house. So then we add a little bit of energy and that's in the compressor unit. So just the opposite of what happens in the expansion valve, in the compressor, all of a sudden you're compressing it, compressing the vapor and it warms it up, turns it into a warm gas and it goes out into the, uh, into the indoor unit once again to heat your house. And the amount of energy required in the compressor will be a little bit more as it gets colder in the outside air. Now, for those of you who want to learn more, there's a, there's a more detailed diagram in the appendix, and I've got three videos um, there of different levels that you can look at and, and uh, learn a lot more about it. So let's talk about classic heat pumps first. Heat pumps have been around for a long time, since the 1950s, and they were designed to work in mild climates. This is an old train diagram see the red is where heat pumps in Colorado doesn't happen to be in the red. They're really designed to work down to 32. And so a lot of people, if they ever tried heat pumps in these cold, colder regions, I would end up saying they didn't really work when it was cold. And they weren't designed to do that. They weren't really designed. But then in the early part of this century, around 2005, a lot of focus started to come into play in the research labs over in Japan about cold climate heat pumps because there was really, there's really no fundamental reason a heat pumps can't work in all the climate zones of North America. And there's a lot of effort put into overcoming some of the problems and I'll, I'll talk a bit about it in the next, the next few slides. And since 2010, there's been thousands of these units installed in New England and the upper Midwest in cold climate zones six and seven similar to our high, high, mountain, high mountain regions. And they've been very progressive because that, quite honestly, simply their fuel costs are much higher than ours for heating. Hi, Dave, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I'm wondering if you can just pull the mic a little bit away from your um, face a little bit more. Um, okay. People have suggested it's a little distorted. Um, How's that, it comes is that through. better? 
Um, I think it's about the same, if, but, but I think we can live with it if it doesn't make any difference. That was just a suggestion yeah, to try. Right. Okay. Yeah. No uh, worries. It works. Try not to talk as loud. Let's see what people say. Um, so to, to develop cold climate heat, heat pumps, um, they had to work in the winter. They had to be a lot more efficient and they had to have more capacity when it was cold. So the engineers sort of turned on any aspect of it. And I'm not going to go into details, but they are able to look at the compressors and make them variable and, and, uh, and, and uh, be able to respond to different temperatures. They looked at the blowers, fan speeds, controls are responsible for, for 20% of the improvement, match the inside and the outside and how well that all works. Um, and improved heat exchanger design. And then of course, obviously fast retarding and defrost operations. So basically this is somewhat of a new type of product. So there's some important terms that we need to, to learn or to be able to talk about. One is tons. Tons are not weight tons like this dude over here. Um, it's heating tons. And one ton is about 12,000 BTUs per hour of heat. And what we look at is how much a home needs. Most homes need in the range of three to six tons. And if you've ever talked to folks with air conditioners or furnaces, you know, oh, an air conditioner's two tons, et cetera. Similar, that's on the cooling side. So they get ranged from 36 to 72,000 BTUs an hour. SEER is a, is a term, um, is basically referring to cooling, how well uh, the cool, uh, air conditioner cools. It also applies to heat pumps since they can do both heating and cooling. So there's a SEER rating, higher the number, the better. The big number we need to talk about is the HSPF, the heating season performance factor. And that's how well it can heat in the winter, how effective it is. And I'll show you in some slides how that's improved. Coefficient of performance is another way to look at energy efficiency. You can look in the appendix. It's just a different methodology for, for measuring um, energy efficiency. Another thing I need to mention, I did that the heat pump outputs air into your home at about 95 to 105. Furnaces are much warmer. Um, if you put your feet in front of a heat pump register, uh, as I did as a youth in Buffalo, trying to warm up after playing hockey, it's not gonna really do uh, warm them up fast. But the thing about it, so people say, well, heat pumps feel kind of cold. Well, yeah, if you actually put your hand near it, it, it won't feel warm. It's kind of neutral, but remember, we're only heating a house to 72 degrees. So heat pumps tend to just run a little bit longer and keep a much more consistent temperature. And for up in the high mountains and all of Colorado, there's something called derating, which really means taking into account our altitude. We have thin air, it's less dense. It doesn't hold as much heat. So the same unit won't be able to, to concentrate and move as much heat in high altitudes as it will down at sea level or even in Denver. So you have to, uh, we'll talk more about that, but basically you have to talk to the, uh, the designer and all that they have to take into account. Typically it means we use a bit the system with a bit more capacity or altitude. Now, I really wish I could move this and I can. Let me try to get this out of the way. So let's talk about improvement and energy efficiency. Um, over time. And this bottom is, the, is around 2012, and the left side is HSPF, or that how efficient it is at heating. And back then, the, the best uh, heat pumps were around 8.2 HSPF. Over time, with all those improvements that I mentioned, they've basically been able to get the best ones now are 13. And all, the, most of them on the market range from most of the cold climate ones are 10 up to about 12, 12 and a half. So in this range, and notice how much more energy efficient it is than the old 8.2, 34%, 13 is 59%. So you've got somewhere in the 30 to 45% efficiency gain with the, with the cold climate units. The second thing that everybody was really, um, had to work hard on was, can I get enough capacity to heat the house when it's cold. It's one thing, yeah, it does it, it can handle the defrost, um, it can work when it's really cold, but can it put out enough heat? And this, this shows that evolution. On the bottom axis on the left side is outdoor temperature of zero, and it goes up to 60. The green line is how much heat it takes for a particular home, um, a model home, and this is 
the left side is the ETU or tons. So this is five tons at zero. And you'll notice these blue lines are how much heat the heat pumps can put out. And this is the bottom line is sort of the old technology, say uh, 2010, where it would drop off dramatically below freezing, didn't have a lot of capacity. Over time, they keep evolving. And now you've got some of the best ones up here all the way down to 15, they can, they can even match. And in fact, many of the, of the uh, mini split ductless, their capacity stays pretty much constant all the way down to zero, and then it starts to taper off. Now, in this case, uh, this, you know, you say, well, gosh, Dave, this is a little bit below. Yeah, there's going to be a tiny bit below, but that's very little of the year. And remember, I said in the whole house unit, there's a little bit of a, a little bit of electrical backup to make up this difference because you don't necessarily want to want to spend money on something ridiculously yards for for about 10 hours a year. So I said we have the most challenging um, climate zones of any state in the union, the only with four. Um, from, from the East Coast would be the same as being from Virginia all the way up to Maine. Uh, and there's four climate zones, but really the way you need to look at it and think about it is this really there's two, two, two parts. The middle of the state climate zone six and seven, there's really not much difference in how you would think about designing a heating system that's high elevation, it's all very cold. Um, whereas in the Eastern Plains in the Front Range, and the Southwest, we have climate zones four and five, um, lower altitude, milder, a bit easier design. Today, we're gonna, our models, I'm gonna talk about things up in, in this area, part of the world, up in Eagle is sort of the standard example here. Um, but it applies, what we're doing applies to these milder zones. It's just heat pumps a little bit easier and they're a little more, it's a bit more uh, cost effective. This is the one diagram I think might surprise a lot of folks in Colorado is, um, this is how much energy you use to heat your home throughout a year. Oops, sorry, um, uh, by different temperatures. So this is Eagle and this on the left, way in the lower left is negative 20 degrees outdoor and up to about 62. On the right side is the percent of energy usage, annual use. So about one third of the energy heating is used above basically 35 and above. And this would be the classic heat pumps. Now cold climate down to 15 is really quite easily. So realize at this point, we're at over 80% of our heating needs. And then a lot of, this is where a lot of the cold climate design, we think they go and operate down to negative 15, it's depending on the sizing and, and a little bit of the backup. The climate heat pump's gonna catch almost all of this with maybe a little bit of heating in the background, a little bit of electric in the background, a little supplemental. It's a little tricky for some reason my arrow doesn't work so I have to carefully mouse through every, <laughs> every slide. Um, so let's, how much will you save it when you convert electric heat pump to heat, heat pump, or heat heating? So if you remember there was that term HSPF or that measurement of how effective so electric heating is HSPF is about 3.4. Heat pumps, and remember I said they're in the range, the cold climate ones, 10 to 12 and a half, um, most of them. So I've, I've picked 10 and a half, um, and it divided out means that 3.1, a heat pump is 3.1 times more efficient. The higher this number, basically, the, the more heating you get over a whole season for the same amount of electricity. So, the heat pump's gonna use 68% less electricity than electric heating to heat your home. And you're gonna end up saving somewhere in the range of 50 to 70%. It depends on your exact situation, the exact heat pump. If you're gonna to have to use a little more electrical in the, in, uh, when it's really cold, pure electric heating when it's cold or not. So it's gonna be in that range, tremendous amount of savings. So we're gonna talk about a couple of scenarios for electric homes. I wonder if I can move this thing. Let's see, uh, can't do it. Um, so we're gonna talk about if you have an electric furnace and it needs to be replaced or it's getting old and you're like, well, maybe I should think about replacing it at some point um, to save, you know, start saving money right away. And that's gonna be, you're gonna generally replace that 
electric furnace with, with, the, with the outdoor unit, the heat pump, and the indoor unit, the air handler. And then the other option is most of you might have electric baseboard heaters. And in that case, the mini split ductless systems are really good. And you have an outdoor unit again, two refrigerant lines going, and you can have multiple indoor units. And we'll talk about how you think about that and design um, to be able to heat different sections of your house really cost effectively with these mini splits. I know some of you also have electric boilers for radiant. Um, and I have a, a slide or two to touch on, on that option. So let's, let's, let's this is a uh, model of a sample house, a 2,000, square foot house. And basically this, this is called a right suite, which is a, you put the house into the model, you build the model, all the windows, everything. And it, it will, you could put different systems in and it will, it will calculate how much energy you use. And on the left side is an electric furnace or a baseboard would be basically the same. Um, this would be the annual heating cost I've used. Um, you know, I've used Eagle Climate and uh, 10.5 cents a kilowatt hour. Ignore this one, that's next week talks, propane world. Um, and over here is a, uh, a hot whole house uh, heat pump system with an air handler and ducting. And you can see that, you know, the saving estimated savings for this house at Eagle Colorado is quite notable. But let's look at, okay, well, that's fine and dandy, but how much is it going to cost me to put this in? What is it all going to take? Does it really make sense for me to do that? So let's say you're going to look at your electric furnace and say, well, you know, maybe I'll need to replace it. It's getting old or it's failing or what. So here's your annual heating cost. And I've added a little bit here. Um, actually, up in the high country with wind chill and stuff, there's a little more defrosting that happens automatically. It's a 10%, a little more. So this is the total cost. And you've got $2,743 that you save every year on your, on your heating. So then what's the cost up in um, your part of the woods? My understanding is, you know, some of the, uh, this, this is uh, sort of a median cost of what it would be to replace an electric furnace. This would be a heat pump plus an air handler plus you know, some modif some ducting, make sure you can interface it really good. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, this would be a Holy Cross's rebate. Um, Nikki's gonna talk about some of the other rebates up in your, up at this area. Um, this is a modest one. Uh, and so the result is you've got about $6,800 more you would have to invest, but 6,800 bucks, uh, basically it's a 40% ROI and it's, uh, I should have done the other decimal place, but basically you're saving about 2,700. So it's probably, it's, it runs about two and a half years to three years, you'll get your money back. Um, and so then the annual heating costs, financing. And so you save a little bit, uh, you know, if you finance it, I'm, I'm looking at 5% for seven years. If they add the financing cost on, um, you still, uh, even though you finance a bit more, you still save some money over those first seven years. So this is, uh, we're going to talk about ductless mini splits, and this really talks, speaks to a lot of you with baseboard. It doesn't preclude doing this strategy in other homes. Um, if there's parts of your other home with electric furnace and ducting and, and a room's cold or something, you can certainly apply this. The nice thing about this technology, which is really quite advanced, is you've got different ways to, to distribute the heat, depending on what you like as aesthetics. And here's the ceiling one, here's stuff on the wall, probably a lot of you've seen it, floor units. Um, I think one of, the, one of the later ones are called these very slim ducted units. So these are kind of nice, you can hide them in the attic and maybe do a small little duct system off, or you can get two rooms out of one, you can put them in the, in, the, in the basement, maybe hang them under a couple of rooms. So the nice advantage of these is they can be hidden and you can actually get sort of two rooms off of one. Um, nice, nice benefit. So we just, so for mini splits, we're gonna look at a little bit smaller area, 1,000 to 1,500, two to five rooms. Um, Depending on the scenario, this is a unit with, with either three wall or three floor units, or three floor units or a couple of those little ducting. So you've got 
quite a bit of savings. I didn't show you, I ran the same kind of uh, manual J uh, right suite analysis. Um, and in this case, we're using very little electric strip heat because those these uh, mini split heat pumps can actually carry a lot of load all the way to minus minus five to minus thirteen. Um, I added in some. I already added in the defrost just to keep it simple, or ten percent extra. So you save uh, eighteen hundred seventy-two, which is around over sixty-five percent um, cost uh, is annual heating savings. It's quite a bit. In this case, you're not going to obviously take your baseboard all out of your home. Um, so you're going to put, this is just a, a, a pretty straightforward system, one outdoor unit, um, hang these units on the walls. You get a rebate from Holy Cross, you get another rebate. So you've got 10,850 cost after the rebates. Um, you're saving uh, almost 2,000 a year. So this in case would take close to about six years, 17% um, to pay back. But remember, this is at today's electricity prices, then, which probably they're going to stay pretty stable. I mean, there's inflation costs, but also going renewable is becoming less and less expensive. Um, so let's look at how you might think about applying mini splits to some homes. <clears throat> so a single multi-zone unit, typically in these cold climate areas, the biggest kind of unit for existing homes, assuming they're, you know, they're reasonably well insulated, not super insulated, is about 1,500 square foot, but new homes would be 2,000 roughly. And the mild climate zones down in the East Denver or in the West Grand Junction, you can do a bit a bigger home because remember the altitude I talked about is a factor. Um, and one outdoor unit can normally heat as many as four zones. Now, if you look in the literature, they can say they can do eight rooms, put a bunch of units all over that. We really need for commercial applications. In, in a home, you're not going to have those small of situations. Number of Indian units you'll need is generally a number of rooms minus one. Um, you know, if a couple rooms are open to each other, et cetera. Focus on the main rooms, uh, especially if you've got baseboard. It's not worth having these things heat little closets, mud rooms, bathrooms. Just leave those on the baseboard. Um, really hardly any energy to heat them anyway. So let's, some more applications, you think about it, two-story homes. If you have a two-story existing home, uh, electric baseboard heat, and, and all of a sudden it's getting hot, uh, you know, you're getting tired of the second floor being hot, or that's a driver, it's uncomfortable, um, then you know that could be a priority. You put a system in below, um, you have these units up in the attic, works really well. Um, if getting the most out of the annual savings, you really want to do the biggest area. You want to do the main floor. Uh, the other thing is if you have a home with really high ceilings, a, say, let's say a great room or a big uh, living area, kitchen combo, you might want to say, well, I'll go after that. <clears throat> that can save me the most money. Um, if you got large single story a ranch home, very spread out, you want to look at the different section. You might say, well, okay, the north side's freezing all the time. Why don't we Put a mini split to deal with that. The south side's too hot, east or west. Um, and new additions are really nice because you can put one simple little unit in, excellent heating and cooling, not very expensive. You don't have to extend ducts or whatever your current system is or baseboards. And if it's ducts, you don't have to say, well, gosh, all of a sudden I have to upgrade my electric furnace. So four rooms over garage is another great example. So I want to talk a little bit, another benefit of electrification is um, and moving um, to heat pumps, they're so much more efficient and that's a great reduction in CO2, um, if that's something that's important to you. On the left side is the amount of CO2 per year and this is a car, this line shows a car. So people I think are surprised at how much um, they use for um, heating their home in terms of emissions, because you're always looking at um, EVs and stuff, but but changing your heating can have a big effect. This is in 2020. Um, and, and Holy Cross and uh, many of the utilities in Colorado are really working hard to, to decrease the um, CO2 in the grid and notice that the big dramatic change out to 2030, even with you know, keeping electric, it goes down a lot, but notice that with the heat pump way down. The other thing is there is a nice peer program um, with Holy Cross if you really want to get this reduction now, you can sign up for that. Um, and, the, and the energy is more renewable. The other thing it's, uh, isn't in here, but obviously if you've got opportunity for solar on your roof, 
that changes this too for the, for the more favorable. If you're gonna take this time, you should work on your indoor air quality, certainly. Um, and if you're gonna change out a furnace, it's very easy. You can add something called a heat recovery ventilation system. And that's, um, that's the next technological advance over opening the window. Um, you know, when it's really cold out, uh, my wife still insists on opening the windows, but um, you, you have what's called a heat recovery ventilator. And so very cold air comes into the home. It's pulled in, not a lot, a very low flow rate. And it comes across the heat exchanger. And a little bit of the warm air is coming out of the house. So basically it's, it's a little bit similar to a heat pump in a way, except it's not quite as mechanical and efficient. But you say so you temper the air comes into the, in, and if it's an electric furnace or an air handler system, it just comes in there, feeds it in and it warms up to 72. If it's this independent system, you're just putting a very small amount of fresh air consist continuously to, to keep air exchange going, going through the house. And here's an example, like I could, I could put a little one of these in the attic. Um, I don't know, they show it going through all rooms if you have a way to move it down, but typically, you know, this would be for the bedrooms if you want fresh air in the bedrooms. This also works if it's extremely hot outside, same principle. Um, in that case, super hot air from the outside, you don't wanna to have to re-air condition it, so you, so you put a little air out. Um, and a couple other things, when the water heat you're displacing, uh, this is not so much for indoor air quality, but just a place to put it. Um, we now have electric heat pump water heaters. This is a nice advancement over the last four or five years. Um, and they use 70% electricity, so they'll save a lot of money too. Um, so when you need to replace your electric water heater, consider uh, that's a good thing. The other thing is replacing your wood fireplace with a pellet fireplace. Um, I have some information on this in the, uh, the appendix. So one of the questions would be, well, okay, how much am I spending to heat my second floor? How much am I spending to heat my own house? So the way to do that is you, you basically figure out your September electric bill and you subtract it from the electric bill each month, October through May, then you add it all together. Um, and that's gonna give you a reasonable idea. And then you say, well, how much in the second floor versus the first floor? Um, it's, you know, it's a crude rough thing, but it's, it's a good way to get, get, get a ballpark idea of how much you do by square footage or if you split your first floor in half. So that's at least the starting point to think about, okay, well, how much am I spending and what, am I, what do I wanna do when I talk to the contract? Um, getting a good design, um, it's a manual J, it's a, it's a method, it's, it's the modeling stuff. You put the house in, you pick Eagle or wherever you live. This shows the temperature range and how many hours per year. And notice, remember I said, not many hours, even up, up, up high here, um, you know, below minus one, you've got less than a hundred hours a year. Below minus six, you've only got about 40, you know, a few nights, not a lot. So what you want is a really nice size match. I showed this before, but you know, in this case, I've, I, let's say this is a whole house. I'm gonna replace the furnace. I'm gonna put an uh, air handler and a heat pump in with a little electric in that built in the air handle to handle this little bit of extra. This is a nice match. This would be a, not a good match, too small. Needs to be bigger system. So this is some questions and I, uh, I'll just run out of time. So I'm gonna zip through them quickly. This is you're talking to man, manual, uh, your contractor. Did you, you know, did you, did you use manual day to design my system? Did they make sure it qualify for rebates? You know, how, how much heating, what's my load or my heating requirements when it's 17, when it's really cold? Did you take into account altitude? And everyone up here knows this. All the all the contractors um, should know this. What's the what's the heat pump? You know the one you've got in. How much output can it do? What's the minimum outdoor operating temperature of the equipment? You know, is it zero? Is it minus five? A lot of them are minus thirteen. How many hours per year is it going to use supplemental heat? Or I might have to keep one of the baseboards on a little bit. And you know, this is a great question. Why is your cold climate heat pump product better than others? There's a lot of great products out there. There is a little nuances in just in terms of, oh, how much capacity they have when it's really cold. Um, how do they do their defrosting scheme, et cetera. If you got an electric furnace, um, you know, typically you ask the contract, let's size it so we can do as much as possible with the heat pump and not have to use a little electric. 
Also the ducting, I mean, this is kind of a system with a lot, this is the gas vent, but you've got sort of, you know, ah, okay, ducting. A lot of times the, the contractors will come in and they'll say, you know, for the heat pump, you want better airflow. We're gonna, we're gonna look at a couple of returns. We're gonna add some supplies, thermostat location. So really talk to them about, you know, is my, uh, is my ducting good enough? Should I do simple zoning? A lot of these older homes uh, have just one thermostat. It's pretty easy to add two in and sort of divide the duct system in half. Um, with many splits, they wanna basically take into account elevation for both. Um, if it's gonna be the sole heating source with a little bit of your backup with, uh, with your baseboard, you're gonna to wanna to have them design it for cold temps. Um, when in doubt, make sure it's big enough because these things can wind down. And, and think about the loads, similar heating requirements. This, um, this is an example where they say, oh, I'll put one in each room. Well, you know, that's a little bit overkill. I, in a laundry room, I keep my little electric baseboard. These three rooms are, are down the first floor. Maybe if I want to keep the temperatures the same, I put a little, little mini ducted up here and have it do the three rooms. Maybe, maybe the same for two of these, or I put one in each of these rooms. So really, really think about, you know, what you want in your home. Uh, some quick stuff about uh, putting these in. Um, you know, sure, heat pumps are great when it was, you didn't have to worry about them freezing, but now you gotta make sure they're protected. And they gotta be high enough off the ground. Mount of the height above the average snow depth. Um, you know, rifle four degrees is the average snow maximum month, four, four inches, I apologize. You know, veil's a lot different. So you wanna have it up high. You wanna have it well protected. You don't wanna have it sort of draining on the sidewalk. Um, think about where it's going to play. These units are much quieter than they used to be, but I wouldn't put it like right under a bedroom window. Um, this is a nice setup here. See how high off the ground they're well protected. I don't know what side of the house on. It's great, great installation. Here, not so much. I don't want to go out and I don't want to go out and shovel snow to get my my uh, <clears throat> my house warm. Ask for pictures of their installation. Um, how do you talk, how do you find a good contractor, you know, recommendations, um, go to the manufacturer's websites, find the, the top notch, uh, you know, they usually have a list of this premium dealers. Um, do they talk about heat pumps on their website? Ask them, you know, they've been installing many heat pumps. They might say, yeah, or no, um, you know, get a couple quotes to start. Um, if they're far apart, then I get a third. Be cautious of low quotes. Um, and you know, these are a lot more effort um, to put in than just saying, oh, I just replaced the furnace, same size, or, you know, it, more effort, um, but it's gonna save you a lot over time, great system. So, you know, um, consider the contractor, find one you like, consider them your teammate. Um, and I just wanna talk a minute, you know, about there's a lot online, obviously every industry is getting online disruption, you have to be, a little thoughtful when, when you get a contract to purchase, this is a 15 year deal. So that, one thing you really wanna understand is who's standing by the, the warranty. If it's Mitsubishi or train, you know they're gonna be around, they're gonna have the money and the parts. Um, but when you, know, you go through the contractor, you got a manufacturer, the contractor, Colorado distributor, Colorado or Rocky Mountain manufacturers rep, they're all supporting you. Online, you have to be just, I'm just saying do your diligence because it might be the manufacturer, but you know, does the manufacturer have facilities in US of A? Do you have a compressor? Or is it the online retailer that backs up the, uh, the warranty? In which case it's unclear then, I'll um, stand by that. And you know, talk, the contractors might not be so supportive of this. Um, those of you who have electric boilers, there are called air to water heat pumps. Um, they can, uh, they can output water at uh, temperatures for in floor and lower temperature stuff, stuff that needs 110, 115, 120, not radiant baseboard. It requires 180 degrees water. Um, typically these are combined in a nice hybrid system. So you will cut your bill. Um, a lot of that depends on your specific. There's a, some products available in the US with some installation history. Um, look in the appendix. There's a couple of reps there. I would. You know, if, you're, if, if you really want to start worrying about cutting down and think about this, plan ahead. Call them up, chat with them, tell them what you got in your house. Um, and I think I'm running over time. Getting on. So uh, this is the last slide summary. Uh, I'm not going to read it. Basically, you know, we've talked about 
the advantages, cold climate technology, working with your contractor. Um, you have great options. Think about your options. Think about your house. Um, Nikki's going to describe some of the local support rebates and, and contractors. And in the appendix, I have tons of information for people who build new homes. Got a whole section on new home options, et cetera. And maybe in the future, we'll have like a seminar dedicated just to new home instruction. So I'll turn it over to Nikki with that. Thanks, Dave. That was great. Um, we have a few questions that have come in. So right after I um, mentioned these local incentives, I will ask a question and then hand it over to Matt and Mary to rotate with me and ask a few more questions. But first, just so everybody knows, um, Holy Cross Energy has excellent rebates for energy efficiency um, for heat pumps, meaning you're already electric and you're going to go to an electric heat pump. So that's $600 per ton um, for a cold climate heat pump. They also rebate heat pump water heaters at $450. So keep that in mind. Um, Walking Mountain Science Center, um, that's us. Um, and that we service the Eagle River Valley. So every, uh, everywhere from Vail to Dot Zero and in between. We have energy efficiency rebates as well. And that's $500 for a home per year. So if you do do a heat pump from electric to electric heat pump, we have an extra $500 for you. I will note that um, in each of these sections, you'll see that there are some larger incentives, the second line in Holy Cross and that second line for Walking Mountains, that's for electrification. So if you know someone that's uh, fuel switching from propane or natural gas to an electric heat pump, there's some even larger increased incentives for that kind of measure. Um, Garfield Clean Energy or CLEAR, um, that's in Garfield County. They offer up to $1,500 for commercial properties. And then Glenwood Springs Electric does have a residential and commercial heat pump rebates. The residential is $1,000, so keep that in mind. And CORE, um, and they service Pitkin County as well as the Eagle County area that is in the Roaring Fork Valley. They also have heat pump rebates that are up to $2,500. So talk to them and, and find out more information as well as uh, rebates for heat pump water heaters. So the, the few things I can stress about local incentives is to talk to these nonprofits in your areas when you're starting your project, before you make a lot of your decisions to verify that what you decide and what you choose is gonna qualify for one of the rebates because there are um, qualification measures um, as far as HSPF, which you see up there in the right, and the fact that the, uh, everybody wants it to be sized right. Um, and as, as far as a few other random things. So be sure, like I said, to check with these local nonprofits, get in touch with Holy Cross at the beginning of your project. So we can, we can all help you um, along the way and make sure you qualify for all the incentives available. These local contacts, they will be in the addendum or right here in the slides. So this is who you contact in those local areas if you have questions about rebates or you just want an energy coach to kind of help guide you and you have some more questions. So we will send these slides, like I said, or this is recorded. So we will also send a link to the recording. And I am gonna go ahead and start off, Dave, with asking you a question. Um, so I wanna ask you a question that a couple people asked and I'll just read it exactly like they wrote it. Um, so the coldest days are clear and sunny. Do you ever see systems with a hot box for preheating air with something akin to a cold frame? I'm not using the right name. With an enclosed black surface covered by a window, like a thermal air solar unit. Then the heat pump could draw from preheated air. Hope that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Um, certainly if you want to take the effort to do that. It's advantageous, uh, just in the fact that you're going to be, one thing is keeping the weather off the unit. I mean, there is sort of a little even wind chill factor, et cetera. Um, it's not necessary. The one thing you would want to be really careful about is you don't want to have, you want to have enough airflow in and out of that hot box to not constrain the heat pump. So that would be the only thing you have to be very, very aware of. Um, and also how you build the box around the heat pump, you know, the, the fan's gonna move one, is gonna be in certain sides. So um, it's a great idea if you, if you wanna do it, it can't hurt at all, um, but just be cognizant of those couple of little constraints. And then Dave, there's some questions about um, the efficiency. Do we expect the efficiency of heat pumps to improve? To increase? Yep. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. They're gonna. It's gonna keep increasing. Um, I wouldn't let 
that hold you back. Um, but the, the cool thing about heat pumps is there's so many components. There's the components in it, everyone can work on them more and more and more. So, you know, all the engineers at all the major manufacturers are constantly looking for, at, you know, just a little percent here on the, on the compressor, a little percent here on the heat exchanger. Refrigerants in the appendix talks about there's going to be new refrigerants coming out. A lot of that's for, you know, the, to limit the, the potential GHGs of refrigerants. However, when new refrigerants come in, different properties, I got to think about that. So, you know, I would expect, I wouldn't expect the curve to steepen a lot. I mean, it's going to probably be a pretty steady continuing increase, um, typically about one half to one HSPF uh, a year. Or every, I say every couple of years, they don't come out every, every year with new systems. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I know that heat pumps are definitely a big strategy for electrification. So I know that every major manufacturer has bought a heat pump company. So there's a lot of partners like Train and Mitsubishi are together now. So yeah. I do feel that heat pumps, they are gonna work on getting them even more efficient and handling our cold climate even better, although they do very well. So, yeah, and there's going to be another continuing emphasis because, uh, you know, I think AC over time in the cold climates is going to be fading away and just basically people are just going to be putting in heat pumps. Mm -hmm. So, I have another um, kind of simple, easy question for you, Dave. What is the maintenance duration of a mini split pump? The maintenance duration? Um, I don't know. With the outdoor units, you're going to want to have. Uh, every year, some someone come out and check it out. Um, the indoor units are pretty easy self maintenance, and you can take the cover off and take the filters out and change the filters um, once or twice, about six months to a year. Um, so there's not there's not a lot not a lot to really maintain there in terms of the indoor units. So somebody is renovating their three thousand square foot home. They have a, and we all know how this goes. They have a walkout basement that stays cool year round and then a main level with vaulted ceilings that get over 90 degrees. That's where you need a good de-stratification fan to bring that heat down and around. So they were considering changing their all electric baseboard to in-floor electric radiant with ducted heat pump for just the main level so that they have cooling for the summer and supplemental heat in the winter since ceilings are quite high. How does that sound as a workable solution? Um, what, what I would so what I would do in that case, or what I would consider um, is putting in uh, an air source heat pump system as the primary heating system. Um, and so it's going to give you cooling, and they're very comfortable. I mean. There's still a lot of uh, misinformation that the, the duct, you know, air systems aren't quite as clean and as good, um, but they're fantastic now. So, and then I would consider using uh, just the electric boiler as a floor warming system. And I wouldn't necessarily, you know, go with a whole electric boiler and all the radiant inflow. I, you know, I would look at. I have a, a, sheet, a slide on on radiant electric heat. So. Really think about the house a lot because if you go with electric rating as your primary and just use the air source heat pump as backup, you're really not saving a lot of cost and energy. Whereas if you flip it on its head, use the air source as the primary way to keep the place warm, and then the other stuff is just comfort. Um, feel free in those kind of situations to email me. My email's here, and I'll be happy to like look at your plans and sort of give you some advice on general strategies. So. Uh, I'll be happy to do that if you'd like to email me. Uh, so there's a, a couple of questions about ground source heat pumps or geothermal. Mm -hmm. So is this type of system different than a geothermal heat pump? So is a heat pump a heat pump is a heat pump? Um, the, the general functionality is the same. The difference is with the air source heat pump, you're taking, you're extracting heat energy from the outside air. So when it does get cold, even though this technology works fantastic, it, 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 uh, it's harder. So it does use more energy when it's cold to do that. 
Geothermal is a more consistent. The ground temperature basically stays about the average temperature year round. So up, up there, probably average temperature is around 48. Here, it's, the front range is like 52. So what happens with the ground source heat pump is you're circulating water in these closed pipes and you're sucking it from the earth, which is more consistent. So the, the bottom line, the two, the two great differences you'll notice is the heating capacity of ground source heat pumps maintains itself very consistently across um, no matter what the outdoor temperature is and the efficiency stays pretty much the same. Um, I did it for a long time. My recommendation would be to consider ground source heat pumps um, if you're building a fairly large home, um, maybe 3,500 square feet and above, um, then you might think about, about those scenarios. Um, uh, or if you, um, and, you know, if you're really, if your heart's really set on um, radiant in-floor heating um, and, you have a, and you have a big home, then, you know, your choice is ground source heat pump or you could do like a hybrid air source Mm, propane. So, so those are the scenarios I would I would seriously consider ground source heat pump. Mm -hmm. So, Dave, here's another good question. Um, they're interested in retrofitting their house um, to a heat pump. They currently have hot water baseboard heat from natural gas and two evaporated swamp evaporation to like swamp coolers. Uh, they have two large ducts coming through the roof, but that's just for the swamp coolers. Um, the house is not duct ducted for heating. Um, they got a bid from a contractor for an air exchange heat pump, it says, and it came to $80,000, obviously cost prohibitive. Um, much was labor for installing ducts. And they said, would a couple of mini splits be cost effective? What would the most cost effective retrofit be? Um, mini splits would be the most cost effective retrofit. Um, and I would think about all the rooms in your house and the sections of the house that you really want to um, improve the most. And, and those are the ones I would put on a mini split. Um, and it, you know, I had um, that number of about 1500 square feet. Um, if it's a well and so the house can be a little bit more. So think of your house as 1500 square foot sections and look at what section there is the highest priority, either for comfort or look at the biggest section of the house, like the great room. And then I would actually get a, uh, uh, look at a mini split heat pump system with one outdoor unit and somewhere the range of two to four indoor units. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna take care of the section of the home that's um, improved, you want to improve the most. And it's also gonna save you the most because um, then you can sort of turn off the baseboard heating for those zones. So they might need to look, you might want to look at, okay, how many different zones do I have a baseboard? And if I do this section, I can turn this off. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know how big your house is. Feel free to write me again, depending on the size of your house or something. You know, um, it, you might be able to do it with mini splits for less than 80,000. But, you know, once you start stacking these systems on, like 1,500 is depending on 13,000 to 20,000. Then if you needed another section, you know, it'd be the same. So if you want to write me more, I'd be happy to give you a little more specifics. But that's the way I would approach it. Mm -hmm. And I just want to remind everybody that we have more upcoming heat pump workshops. So on next Tuesday on the 19th, if you are heating with a propane system, we'll, we'll dive more into... Um, the choices you have to go from propane to heat pump. And then on January 26th or the 30th, if you have natural gas, which it sounds like this person does, there is an Arctic heat pump. So there are some options to go from natural gas boilers to heat pumps. So um, that's going to be January 26th and, or the 30th. So the same thing. Yeah. Just remember and, the, the heat pumps with the water is baseboards are really high temp. So it's, it's really, it's, uh, you know, you get, it's pretty much for in floor. Um, you can change them out for these super efficient radiators. But we'll touch a little bit more on that in the next couple of seminars. And we will send out um, links to register for those other webinars that are coming up in the next few weeks. If you're interested in the propane to electric heat pump or natural gas 
the electric heat pump Mary mentioned. Uh, we'll try to get a couple more questions in here, Dave. It's only 624. Um, one uh, question, uh, do you mind touching on new construction? Uh, they're considering building a small 1200 square foot house and they want heat pumps to be the primary source of heat. Um, sure. Let me... So um, this is something I'm really trying to work on and make life easier in decision making. Let me go. So in the appendix, there's a, something to address with, with uh, new construction. And so what I'm trying to do here is uh, say, what's a core system? You know, you have different types of systems that you can go for. And what's the, you know, what's the initial cost? What's, how much is it gonna cost to heat and different, different components? This is sort of version one. Um, but the small little house like that, um, I would certainly just, I would, I would really look at um, a mini split strategy. Um, and I would look at maybe um, using those slim ducts because those are really flexible in terms of installation for the contractor and working around your architecture. And the other thing about the mini splits is you can put, I don't know if it's two stories or one story in this case, um, but if it is two stories, you can look at like for the first story, you can put like a, a little air handler in a sort of a little duct system for first story. And then the second story, something in the attic. So um, that's, that's what I would look at. I think that's the most flexible strategy for something on that size. Um, again, if you want to email me, I'll be happy to chat a little more. But I, I, you know, if you want to look at these, I'd love feedback on, on this stuff. People say, well, what's, you know, what other information would you like as building a new home to try to understand all these great options? Yeah, we're considering doing one just for new construction in the future. So if people do have more questions about new homes, um, please respond to our follow-up email or email Dave directly and, and we'll be sure to address those. Um, we'll try to do just still a couple more questions quickly. What filtration is recommended for air circulation because of COVID? Dave, do you have any recommendations there? Um, well, you really want to go with like a HEPA filter. Um, I, I think, um, you know, if you really want super clean air and uh, beyond COVID, um, and I don't know if you have a duct, uh, home ducted system or not, I would just, uh, then recommend, you know, spending the money and going for some real high end, um, HEPA or they have these multiple, um, these filters that are sort of HEPA with some electrostatic um, filtering and you can put on your, your furnace and it'll, you know, it'll be great for clean air past COVID. Um, if you're just worried about COVID, I have like four filters and four portable ones in my house. There's one called Rabbit, which I would particularly like, um, yeah. Is there a specific a nerve number that people should look for or anything like that? Um, yeah, MERV 13. And just keep in mind that all the heat pumps, the indoor units do have filters and they do have to be cleaned on a quarterly basis or so. But so just keep that in mind. Too. That's, that's the beauty. Huh? Uh, I'm sorry, Mary. Uh, go ahead. So, uh, so this is a good one because several of us, including myself, live in an HOA association. So are HOA associations required to let uh, one install the heat pump outside as an energy conservation item according to SB 100? And I don't, Nikki, do you know what SB 100 is? I'll have to Google that. I don't, I apologize. We can probably find the answer for that, but I don't know that right. any of us have the answer. I know in my own complex, I live in Glenwood Springs and I'm on the board. And so we've had a couple of people put in uh, the mini splits and they just have to come to the board and ask for permission to do that. So you might wanna go to your HOA board and ask them and explain what the technology is. Um, they don't make a lot of noise. I know everybody's really concerned about the noise factor, but they do not make a lot of noise. And then one really good one is, do the heat pumps dry out the air like air conditioners? We all know how dry Colorado climate is. Um, do you know much on that, Dave, compared to like a regular air conditioner? Um, 
Yeah, they're well. They're not gonna. They're not gonna dry it out like an air conditioner this summer because the way air conditioner cools is it sort of extracts heat. Um, it, it you know it extracts moisture out, which cools air more. So it's not that the heat pump's gonna actively make the air drier, but um, you know I have a heat pump and a ground source one, and it's you know the air is dry. I mean it's not so. Certainly, you know, if, if dry air is a problem when you do your system, you really want to have a humidifier. Now, a warning, um, steam humidifiers are awesome. Um, they're very energy intensive. They're energy hogs, basically. Um, so unless you have art or uh, instruments or some very strong driving reason to, to go with steam humidifier, I would not go with steam humidifier. Um, and I just want to make a point about the filtering going back. You got to be a little careful. You can't, you know, you can go online and order these MERV filters. Uh, you can't just necessarily go and get a super MERV filter and stick it in your furnace because, um, or your heat pump or whatever, because they're designed with certain airflow. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you know, you could be, you could be sort of choking it off. So um, I would, um, you know, you might talk to the your person who put it in, or 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 have someone come take a look at it, because you don't want to, uh, you don't want to really choke your system, and that and that's something that could happen. So we will continue to try to answer questions, but it may end us right at six thirty. So I'm just giving everybody a warning, and I wanted to say thank you again to uh, Garfield Clean Energy Core, Holy Cross Energy, Energy Smart Colorado, and uh, Colorado Energy Office, and Walking Mountains, all for kind of sponsoring this event. So. Thanks. We do have three more questions, Dave, if you don't mind, we'll ask him and see if it yeah. lets us just continue to go. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, let's see if Mitsu, if, if a Mitsubishi MXZ outdoor unit compressor is quite loud, what kind of problem might be the cause? Ooh. There's a couple of things, bouncing the fan, the refrigerant might not be charged quite at the right pressure. So you gotta call call your guy out and have him look mm -hmm. at it. Those are a couple of things that come to mind immediately. And uh, make sure with Mitsubishi that you get a diamond certified contractor that has gone through the Mitsubishi training. Yeah. Um, and that's a good point about how the installation is so important with heat pumps. If you don't have a contractor that is really familiar and has done several heat pumps, you aren't going to be happy with the results. I would definitely get pictures of their installations, especially their outdoor units, et cetera. Um, because really up there, you want to, you know, you want to put, keep it good from the weather, et cetera. So mm -hmm. uh, Mr. has a great rep. Um, so if you can't, uh, you know, if you can't get uh, a contractor to sort of solve the problem, um, Mary's got the contact. Yep. For, I can get uh, you connected with the Mitsubishi rep who can help yeah. you. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Hey, Dave, there's a quick question that's just in chat. And I don't know if you know, and that's okay. If you don't, we can answer the question later. But do you know if there's any tax credits available for the heat pump technology? There was. <laughs> Currently, ground source, yes, air source, no, um, mm. but- I think there is, I think there is, Dave. We'll have to look into that because that's a good question. Yeah. I believe there was. It expired, but possibly in the bill that was just passed in December, they might've put some back in. And if not, um, maybe this year. For those of you who don't mm -hmm. put tax credit for pellet stoves in, 26% <laughs> pellet stove tax credit. Um, mm -hmm. I, yeah, I, unless they put something in December, I know it had, they had let it lapse, but uh -huh. I would yeah. expect it to be in any kind of bill this year, potentially. Okay. And then there's one on the electric, the electric heat pump water heaters work the same. So do they work the same and do they have good efficiency ratings? Uh, yeah, they have excellent right. ratings. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to think about a couple things though is they do work by taking heat out of, out of the air. Um, so you have to have, like you can't put them in a closet <laughs> that's closed in. You can put them in kind of a room if, or if you put them in some small area. You have to duck them. Send them to like an adjacent room. Now, I know you're gonna ask, well, gosh, then doesn't it make my rooms cold? 
Not really, no. And it's energy efficient because it's really easy to, you know, it might lower the temperature in an adjacent big room by a degree. Um, so it's not going to have a big, huge impact on like the overall heating bill. Um, so just be aware of that. Um, and um, the other thing is there will, you know, you have a condensate line that you have to do. So um, there's a couple little nuances, but they're, but they're fantastic products. Mm -hmm. Yes. I know these, the these are excited about them. Yes, yes. And, uh, and they are a part of electrification. And also if you have an electric water heater, they can reduce your bill, like Dave said, like up to 70%. So, um, and I've seen them in a very small closet, as long as they're ducted. So um, some, some yeah. contractors are getting very creative with them. And yeah. then one last question is for a four building condo currently on hot water baseboard, natural gas, boiler heat, any cost savings? And I think that's one we're gonna talk about in a couple of weeks, right? Right. Um yeah, I mean, current natural gas prices probably probably not much. I mean, there'd be other motivations to do that, but uh, yeah, we'll touch on that stuff in a couple of weeks. But you know, off the top, I'm not, yeah, you're not going to save a lot now. You know, we'll we'll talk a bit about natural gas and pricing and, and sort of hedging against future gas and insurance. Gas went up. Winter gas costs and Excel Network went up about 15, 20 percent compared to last year. So. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, tune in in two weeks. Yes, definitely. Tune in in one week and then again in two weeks. <laughs> yeah. For everyone that's left. Again, we're here. <laughs> we're here for three Tuesdays in a row. Um, thanks again, everybody, for coming. It's great that we had so many people attend. Uh, and so many people excited about this technology. We want to be right. here, not only Walkie Mountains, but all your other nonprofits and Holy Cross to just help you through this process, help you understand it and provide educational workshops like these. So please reach out to any of us right. anytime. Dave has our contact info up there and have a great evening. Thanks everybody. Thank you everyone for attending. <laughs>